Many of you guys remember this young man from this interview about 10 years ago. Let me get you to go ahead and tell us your first and last name. James Rodney. Spell your last name, James? B R O A D E N E. All right, James, and um, you're 19? Tell me why you agreed to do an interview today. Because I want to tell my story. What is your story? I don't want nobody, you know what I'm saying, sugar cold shit. I'm going to tell you all what, what it is, you know what I'm saying? Straight up. Okay. I don't need my cousin, my auntie, and none of them motherfuckers to tell shit for me. What do you want to say? What y'all want to know? Tell me what happened in, in the parking lot of that recording studio. What happened? What happened? Kill that bitch ass. Yeah. Why? So we get out there and shit, time just tick, tick, like, man, fuck it, you know what I'm saying, shit, something got to go down, dog, because it's a long ass walk back to South Dallas, you know what I'm saying, so shit, we walking through, uh, by, you know what a recording thing is, right, you know what I'm saying, in the bank right behind it, so we walking through the parking lot, you know what I'm saying, and shit, somebody, well, I guess the motherfucker, uh, who was on the passenger side of the car, whatever, he was out there burning something, you know what I'm saying? And he threw the shit in the, uh, in the dumpster, you know what I'm saying? I'm like, dog, you know you can get a, uh, you can get a ticket for that, right? It's vandalism, you know what I'm saying? So we got to, uh, topping it up and shit, you know what I'm saying? Talking about the studio, because I rap and all that good shit, you know what I'm saying? So. Did y'all hear him just say, then told that man he can get a ticket for that? Uh, don't you know you can get life in prison or the death penalty for killing somebody? But let me let him go on. Oh, nice shit. Fuck, you know what I'm saying? We finna get ready to leave. I went back and asked him, like, man, y'all got a, uh, one of y'all got a cigarette? You know what I'm saying? He's like, yeah. So, shit, he went to go reach for it, pulled the pistol, shot him, shot the driver, whoever the fuck he was. Shit, he like, the one I shot at first, he stumbled back, you know what I'm saying? Like, dropped, got back up like he was finna run. The one I hit second, you know what I'm saying? He raised up like he was finna do something, so I shot him in the head, you know what I'm saying? Then the other one shit, shot him twice in the head. Just make sure, fuck that. You know what I'm saying? I don't need that shit. You know what I'm saying? Lay that shit down. You know what I'm saying? So me and my cousin uh, ran their pockets. You know what I'm saying? Got the keys, got their wallet and shit. I, I want y'all to know that, that they got two dollars off of them two people. Two dollars. And the driver hopped in the passenger side. We did. So they did nothing to you or nothing to provoke you, but you just felt that you could take their life? When they, you know what I'm saying? I just blanked out, you know what I'm saying? Like, when that shit happened. Because, man, I ain't ever killed nobody before. You know what I'm saying? I done shot ass people before. Ain't no problem if you pull a pistol, you know what I'm saying? I don't give a fuck about no girl play. You know what I'm saying? Shit. You killed two young men now. Better they life than mine. Do you have any remorse? None whatsoever. Do it look like What would you say to either of these families? They leave behind babies and widows. I got a family too. Do you, I mean, so you're gonna, what do you think is gonna happen to you now? Whatever they throw in. Hopefully the death penalty. Hopefully? Yeah. Why do you hope? Can they that? give me life? I'm gonna kill somebody else. Straight up. I'm telling you right now. I can't do no motherfucking life. I'm going to go crazy. So you want the death penalty? They better pick one. Or you going to have some more bodies.
Oh, you're gonna hear you're gonna kill someone? No. Nah. Whichever penitentiary they send me to, they better put me on death row. Tell you just like I'm gonna tell the judge. And then the motherfuckers said, God, and anyway, I already told me, are you fucked up? Well, maybe so. Everybody got to die someday. I think people tonight will hear your side of the story and almost think this is sick that you feel this way. How do you respond to that? How I respond? Fuck, fuck, fuck. Even if they sell it. I know the game is crazy. It's more crazy than the sell a bit. I'm married to that crazy bitch. I'll be Kevin Federley. That lady has no idea that that man <clears throat> just spit some Lil Wayne lyrics. Anything else you wanted to say? I don't want to tell my mom, my brother, and I'm going to give y'all their names so they'll know who the fuck I'm talking about. Idra Kelly, Aaron Easton, Nakia Martin, and Korean Martin. I love y'all, dog. Take care of my motherfucking nephews and nieces. Is it your aunt who turned you in? To be honest, I don't even know. You know what I'm saying? The story I got, oh, that was my, my auntie, my auntie snitched on me. My cousin, as soon as they locked us up in Garland, you know what I'm saying, in the feds, so the lieutenants got up in his face talking about all that time he broke down and started crying. You know what I'm saying? Just like a hoe. Did he pull with, did Nah, he pull I pulled the trigger. He was just there. That's accomplished the murder, though. You know, you know what that? Well, you know what he's trying to say? He need to get some time, too. I'm going to probably get the death penalty. He going to probably get 25 to life. Ain't no telling. But you pulled the trigger. Yeah. And you robbed these guys? Merc both of them. Now nah, we robbed them. I killed them. How much money I did popped that bitch ass, you know what I'm saying? He ran their pockets. We hopped in the slab and dip. How much money did you get from them? Shit, I don't know. I would See, he, he too ashamed to realize, I mean, to admit. That he only got two dollars, he gonna say he don't know, he didn't count. Uh, it's not that hard to count two dollars. I ain't finna go to no damn ATM. I ain't that, you know what I'm saying? That don't make sense. What, do what do don't make sense? sense is to kill somebody after you rob. First of all, it don't make sense to rob somebody. But if you're gonna rob somebody, why you gotta kill them? Especially when you could have just easily got away. Police caught up to you. What I think, when they hit the lights, I said, damn. And started laughing, you know what I'm saying? Just like I'm doing now. And looked them in their face with a big ass smirk. Y'all ain't got shit on me, dog. But I do want to see the evidence. Yeah, I killed them. But what evidence y'all got on me? I know y'all ain't got no videotape. No fingerprints, but in the car. I just can't believe you killed two people and you're laughing about it. Yeah. Just like when they stick that damn needle in my arm, they're going to laugh at me. Look at that nigga. Dumb motherfucker. How y'all is, dog? Fuck, just like I said. Fuck his family, too. Both of them. Anybody, do you have anything, Patrick? Okay. Anything else? I said, I said, I love you, my family, dude. Yeah, make sure my mama see that. How, many, how, long, how much of your life have you spent in jail? Shit, I was locked up in juvie for a good six months. Mm, spent a couple of days in jail, regular jail, for a couple, um, possession of controlled substance. You know what I'm saying? And that's it. I ain't got no dirty ass record. You know what I'm saying? Look at my shit, it's clean. Not anymore. Yeah, fuck. I only got I can judge. Anything else? Anything else you want to say? How do you think? How do you think you'll be judged? Fuck him too. The devil ain't his army too. Fuck all of them. Some people might say you are the devil. Maybe. Look me in my eyes and tell me what you see. I don't think that'll be cut out for television. Good. How long have you been? You came here what day? I Man, I've been this bitch about. Two or three days, I ain't even count. I'm just waiting on them to sentence me. Come on with my lawyer. I don't even need a fucking lawyer. Do you have a lawyer yet? No. I ain't got the money for one I showed here. I ain't got no million dollars for no fucking bun or no honey G's either. Shit, if I did, I wouldn't have robbed a nigga. And Merc, what were you robbing him for? Drug money? 
Um, I don't appreciate that comment. All the stuff, like, he could have been trying to pay bills. Not that it makes it right. He could have been trying to get some food money. But she gonna automatically assume it's for drugs. Money, car, and whatever the fuck else came with it. You know what I'm saying? I mean, wouldn't be no drugs if that's the case. I know plenty of dope boys to go hit. They holding the keys and pounds. You know what I'm saying? But why do that when I might get caught with the dope and still get a kingpin charge? You know what I'm saying? Do you regret robbing them? Do I regret? Do you wish you would have never gone to Garland that night? Yeah. But you don't regret killing them. You just wish you would have avoided that situation. I wish I wouldn't have had that pistol on me. Then I wouldn't have murked them. But some of them going to still get robbed either way it go. You know what I'm saying? Because that was the whole agenda was. And right now as we're talking, they're burying these two men in their funerals. Still not an ounce of sympathy, not an ounce of remorse for them or their families? No. Fuck. Be a man they fucking family. All right, thank you. He said, no, F them, them, and they F and family. Brothers, tell me what happened last week, sir. What time? Where were y'all going when you encountered these two men? See, I wasn't going to go out in there first, you know what I'm saying? We just riding around and shit, you know what I'm saying? Just passing by time and shit, smoke, you know what I'm saying? Y'all smoking weed? Mm -hmm. All right. What happened? You decided to go to Why? Why he gonna assume weed and blunts? He could have been smoking regular cigarettes, but these stereotypes are crazy. Where were you? In Oakland, then, or what? Uh, we was in East Dallas. In East Dallas. And on our way to downtown Dallas on the bus, you know what I'm saying? Just riding around the chip. And then y'all decided to go to Garland. How'd y'all come to Garland? I decided to go hit a lick. You know what I'm saying? And she one of the best spots in Garland, because that's where all the rich white folks stay at. You know what I'm saying? So she got caught, caught a motherfucker slipping. She ain't popped his bitch ass. That's what it is. You saw him walking, were they walking towards their car? See, this is what happened. You know what I'm saying? Downtown, Dallas chilling, you know what I'm saying? And she before the train stopped running, she had told my cousin. Like, shit, man, let's hop on the train, you know what I'm saying, go to uh, downtown Garden, you know what I'm saying? So, shit, we got to make something happen, because if we get out there and get stuck, you know what I'm saying, nigga, that's a long-ass walk back, you know what I'm saying? So, shit, I had this little pill or whatever. So, shit, went out there, got out the train, you know what I'm saying, just walking around and shit, seeing them coming out the studio, chopped it up with them, you know what I'm saying, asking for a cigarette, shit, and shot that bitch ass. That's what it is, hopped in that shit and rolled up. First time you shot somebody? Did you know he was, you knew they was dead? Yeah, I made sure they were dead. Tell me, sir. You shot them more than once? Yeah. Y'all read it in the newspaper? I know y'all done looked at the bodies and all that shit. I just want to hear from the you. The driver, well, I'm finna tell you. The nigga, the, um, I guess who owned the car or whatever, you know what I'm saying? We finna get ready to walk out because we were talking to him. You know what I'm saying? Because they were coming out of the studio locking it up. He murdered two guys that owned a Christian recording studio. Up and all this shit, you know what I'm saying? So I turned around, asked her for a cigarette, you know what I'm saying? They were like, yeah, we got, you know what I'm saying? No cheap ass cigarettes and shit like that. I was like, man, it don't even matter, you know what I'm saying? I just need a cigarette to smoke, you know what I'm saying? And like, shit, I just blanked out, you know what I'm saying? I, Shit, you know, I blanked the fuck out, you know what I'm saying? And I just went in that mode. Like, shit, I don't know what the fuck it was. I just blanked the fuck out, you know what I'm saying? And shot him. Shit, he like stumbled back, shot the uh, the driver. He hit the ground, you know what I'm saying? But he like leaned up like he was finna try to get back up. So I shot him in the head. Shit, then his homeboy. I shot his ass again, you know what I'm saying? But he was still trying to run off of shit. But I knew he was going to die anyway, but just to make sure, pop, pop, shot his bitch ass, like, you know what I'm saying, twice in the head or whatever. Me and my Kim folks ran in their pockets, you know what I'm saying? He jumped in the driver's seat. I jumped on past the side, and we dipped out. And you wasn't worried about getting caught later? Got nothing to live for. 
Why you say that, brother? Because I don't. I don't even know why the fuck I was born in the first place. Why you say that, Mr. Brodnack? I could have been better off somewhere else. You know, that, that really is sad. When I first watched this, I actually had never seen this part until today, but the first part with the Caucasian interviewer lady, you know, I, I laughed a little bit, especially when he dropped the Lil Wayne lyrics, but <clears throat> if you really listen to him right now, it's very sad. What's your past been like, Mr. Brodnack? Hell. Tell me, sir. Explain it to me. Hell. <laughs> this is what the capital H, capital E, double L, L. Hell. For real. So how do you feel now? You know, see, I kind of regret what I did, but shit can't change. I know you was crying, though. You know you're probably looking at capital murder. Yeah. Two counts. What do you want? I don't want life. You don't want life? Pick one. If they don't, I will. What do you want to say to the families of the two men you killed? Fuck. Straight up. I think he really wanted to say something as far as show some remorse, but I feel like he feels like he has to be very hard and there's no hope for him after what he did. So he's just like, hey, he's already in trouble. Might as well go out with a bang. Can you tell me about your past that makes you feel like you do now about life? Look me in my eyes and tell me what you see. I'm looking at you, brother. I'm looking at you. I understand what you're saying. What's going through your head right now? It really looked like he was about to cry. And so he decided to walk out. I wish he had a, you know, broken down at that moment and let people know that he is human and he's not just some monster, but he chose to walk away. Now let me tell you what happened to him after that. It looks like they shaved his hair off like a America's Next Top Model contestant when Tyra Banks tries to try them. His name is James Garfield Brodnex. Most people didn't even know his name. His TDCJ number is 999549, which is basically 666 backwards or upside down. Date of birth, 1030-1988. So he really just had a birthday. He received this death penalty sentence on 902-2009, and he was 20 years old his highest level of education completed was the 10th grade and the date of the offense was 6 19 2018 in which he was 19 years of age in dallas county his race is black which is questionable to me gender male hair color brown height 6 2 weight 185 eye color brown monterey county was his native county his native state is california Prior occupation was a kitchen worker. Prior prison record, N.A., which he already said he's been in juvie before. Summary of accident, subject and co-defendant shot and killed two adult males with a 380 handgun. Co-defendant is Demarius Cummings. Race and gender of victims would be two white adult males. Here is his cousin the one who was there with him who helped rob the two gentlemen. He was the one he was referring to that started crying like a hoe. His words, not mine. Here is another picture of James Brodnax. Very handsome young man. Mm -mm -mm. Just a waste of good genes, boy. There are the two of them right there.
let's fast forward to 2016. Here is James Brydenax, Letters from Death Row, inmate 999549, as previously stated. His entire demeanor and attitude is totally different. He says, I don't ever want to be a lost soul. We occasionally publish letters from death row inmates. Today, we hear from James Brodnax, who was sentenced to death after being convicted for a 2008 robbery and murder in Texas. Brodnax, who is now 27 years old, now he's actually 29, has been on death row for seven years. He was convicted of shooting and killing a man named Stephen Swan and robbing him of a small sum of money as he left a recording studio. The studio's owner, Matthew Butler, was also shot and killed, which James killed him as well. <clears throat> After his arrest, Brognax gave a striking jailhouse interview to a television reporter, including an admission of guilt and statements of cold bravado, bravado that helped lead to his own conviction and death sentence. In the same interview, Brognax hints at his own history of trauma, saying his life has been hell. Though he does not have an execution date pending, Rodnax wrote us in answer to standard set of questions we ask of death row inmates. He begins with thoughts on his own case. All uh, right, now, as you listen to me read his letter, you will hear that he types, writes, speaks nothing like he did 10 years ago when he was 19. Mr. Hamilton Nolan, my greetings to you. How are you doing today? Hopefully all is well and you're now see this is how I know he only made it to the tenth grade because that should be a question mark after how are you doing today. But let me be serious. Hopefully all is well in your sphere of life and this notation has the capacity to find you in the best of life, mind and health. My name is James Brodnex and to a great extent it's a pleasure to be in the position to be able to pen this letter to you. I'll bite from an inferior placement by scripting these words to you from a cage on Texas death row. Even so, I don't want the seriousness of my situation and immediate circumstances to negate or cloud the energy I wish to convey during this exchange between us. I know the stigma surrounding this place can easily overshadow opinions, but ironically enough, those same extremities created the necessity of me reaching out to you. Whatever may come through this, it's imperative that you know I'm grateful for the opportunity of having crossed paths with you. My interest is speaking to you about the, dyna the dynamics of this subjection. My perspective in the vein of hopefully giving insight in the space of this spectrum we find ourselves in, respectively. I'm aware of the recent events that have took place and the acquisition by Deadspin. I hope that didn't affect your platform or the potential of you being able to post my sentiments in your periodicals of letters from death row. Your work is very progressive, and in the terms of that, I believe we share the ideas surrounding the importance of being able to give voice to this paradigm. It would be nothing short of benefit to share particular views with you and your audience. Thank you for your time and patience. Peace. Sincerely in spirit and struggle, James Brodnack. Now, does that sound like the same dude that was saying F him, even if they're celibate? I'm married to this crazy Calvin Kevin Felon. That don't sound nothing like him. P.S. If you don't have your previous platform available to you, feel free to use this in your future endeavors. All right. Page one. In regards to the platform, I've decided to go with the format that I know has been used before. I'm sure this insight will be of interest to you. My answers to the following questions are as follows. Can you tell me a bit about how you ended up on death row? Yes, I was tried and convicted of capital murder in the city of Dallas. My case involves a robbery and a murder. To be convicted of capital murder in the state of Texas and other states, crime has to consist of a felony in the course of murder, i.e. robbery, multiple murders, arson, murder for hire, etc. However, to the specifics of your question, True enough, that's what I was convicted of, but that's not why I was sentenced to die. If you do a quick Google search of my name, there's no doubt you'll find a horrible, very favorable video of me that was taken shortly after my arrest. Simply put, 
that was the prosecution's case against me and they played it religiously at my trial. I feel that that's what got me sentenced to death, which multiple jurors stated, especially in light of other evidence that wasn't really presented on my behalf. Even the evidence that was, it was severely overshadowed by the interview put on by the state, which I guess is the segue into your next question. Do I believe my arrest, trial, and sentence was fair? No, I don't. I'm not saying that simply because I ended up on death row or any resentment and hatred on my part. I'm saying it because of the factual evidence that could have swayed the trial process or some of which put on the record at all. The crime I'm convicted of is horrific. There is no doubt about that, and my heart truly goes out to the victims and the families. But let's be clear. The evidence in my case, DNA and otherwise, clearly says I did not kill anyone. That's specific, but when you're messed up on drugs, especially PCP, it's easy to believe that I could have been the one to kill the individual I'm on death row for. The influence and after effects made it easy for the state to paint a picture of me as a monster and to my shame and lack of knowledge, I went along because my mind was still then too messed up from the PCP to reasonably object to what was going on with the situation. I couldn't have even coherently or effectively participate in my very own defense. So in light of your question regarding being sentenced in fairness, the key factor is did the state know I was being kept drugged up to try and stem the effects of the PCP while in the county jail, or the fact that upon being booked into the jail and examined by their physicians, I was automatically ordered to the medical ward and placed on suicide watch due to experiencing a psychotic break and having auditory hallucinations? The answer is yes, and they still took full advantage of these facts and allowed particular events to transpire. Now, let me say this. He was too detailed about killing the two individuals and stating that his cousin had nothing to do with the death, just the robberies, and it corroborated with the evidence found at the crime scene. So I don't see how he can sit here and say that the reason why he said he did do it is because he was high off of PCP or the after effects. Hmm. <sighs> Please don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying what I'm saying to blame anyone or lessen my own culpability in my state of mind, both before doing my trial and conviction. <clears throat> I'm only saying for me, my mental state was self-inflicted. Yes, but shouldn't the state have more obligations to make sure I'm not taken advantage of and my constitutional rights not be violated, even though they're trying to prosecute me for a crime? Well, apparently not. The prize of conviction sees to Trump and severely outweigh the oath taken to serve the very people who you may or may not come into contact with. Now, you took advantage of these two people that you robbed and killed, so I don't think the court would care about taking advantage of you. He writes about how he has changed during his time of death row, and this is the main point that I, I, I decided to do this video because it, it, it's a complete 360 from how he was. It wasn't a 180. It was a the full 360. And I wanted to show the world how the young man seemed to have changed. Then again, I'm only one of many considering Dallas County has a history of using those type of taxes to gain a conviction. How do I deal with the psychological burden of having a death sentence? Resolution. To be resolute and have the conviction to see my growth and the evolution of my spirit through. It may seem extreme or even binary, but to me, be the push on and persevere or give up. I refuse to do the latter. I see two aspects to the dynamics of your question. The first being that I recognize I'm up against a subgroup of the very fabric of our society, meaning you had humans, something of a think tank, create a structure to warehouse and break the spirit of other humans, or try to anyway. Mind, body, and spirit. What does that say about the psychology of our system and those who implement it as a means of correction? So I try and stay conscious of the fact that my will is being tested daily by the mind of a generational cycle of torture being mindful of waking up in a cell no bigger than a half bathroom that whenever i'm in an open space i've become accustomed to taking no more than six steps before i turn around or because we're constantly being handcuffed avoiding the conditioning of walking with my hands behind my back everywhere i i am or go to be aware is to be alive 
but even more so, being conscious of the subtle psychological conditioning is everything. Secondly, in a lot of ways, I feel as though life built me for various aspects of this struggle. I choose not to allow someone else's attention and interpretation of death to shadow my path and potential. I've been dealing with psychological trauma my entire life, as I'm sure in one extreme or another, we all have or do. I've experienced near death before, even before contemplating the idea. I was born half blue, discolored, half suffocated me as well. I, I really was. Forced to represent the emotional death of my parents, so the hypothetical notions of someone else's does not affect me if they're not benefit to me. It took time, but the difference is I believe in my vision, period. My soul, the very essence of me, didn't choose to come this far for nothing. I'd be remiss if I didn't see my evolution and purpose through. Do I feel fear about my future? No, in a sense, I don't know what the future holds. I just know the creator won't give you a vision without provision. What I fear about a time I hadn't had the chance to acknowledge is the possibility of my soul being desolate and or losing touch with reality. I don't ever want to be a lost soul or experience a pain so dark I can't come back from and find love. I ask for courage and strength daily not to fall into the void. Has my time in jail changed my political or religious belief in any way and how? Yes, no doubt. I've said one changed because I was ignorant to a lot of his. The other I just grew into. You know, these are pretty interesting topics per se, but they also have the tendency to trigger very emotional charged conversations, which of course can be controversial and start arguments. They also respectively tend to be learned behavior or the closest kind, which is totally understandable considering the various influences projected onto people. But I also think that we have the responsibility to search and find what's true to us individually, not just conform to what you're told to believe or have a particular outlook on. Sometimes, maybe more often than not, I think that trust can be misleading if the foundation of said belief was grounded in the interior motives. So, politics. I wasn't big on politics when I was free or know a lot about the platform for that matter. I still don't consider myself to be a pundit or anything, LOL, but I'm definitely more aware and knowledgeable now than before. I also of that has so with learning about my case in an effort to save my life and better my situation. In turn, you learn about the system globally, not just the criminal aspect of it, meaning the various district courts, state and federal, the U.S. Supreme Court, its judges and other opinions, why it matters for certain district attorneys and local judges to be elected, and the presidential election because it's germane as to what judges they appoint. That's important, obviously, considering it's the person who we choose to make decisions for our country. But the presidency is not the end all be all. There's a lot of sh they can't or won't be able to do because it has to go through the Congress. We've been multiple times with Obama. The local level served the people. That being said, I wasn't told of any of that growing up. I was only iterated to always vote Democrat shrugs. Well, I'm not too fond of them, nor am I of Republicans. However, I will say that I believe in the idea of communism. I don't hold a blind faith towards us gaining a utopia from a political politician or a presidential candidate. I don't consider myself a religious person. I'm saying that I mean in terms of or being a fundamentalist. I think in one way or another, if we have spiritual beliefs, we hold on to, to an extent, you're religious. Maybe just not as devout as the next person. I believe in spirituality and consciousness. I feel I've always held these beliefs since I was younger. It's just then I couldn't articulate it. Personal experiences and seeing different things take place and manifest throughout life has only strengthened the resolution I feel we're all born into. That resolution being spiritual evolution to reach higher states in consciousness, of consciousness, or I guess in different terms, we could say to be Christ-like or attain the awareness of the crystals, anointed one, or the spiritual enlightenment you might gain along the eight fold path of submitting to the will of God slash Allah, or maybe just experience a total isolation to do away with all of the duties odd life in an effort to find the same oneness other disciplines allude to. Whatever floats your boat, LOL, I don't think the growth and evolution of a person's essence should be 
lesson by titles because I ultimately all paths are interconnected just like everything else in the universe. That's the biggest disconnect I see with religion and what I think we get away from innately. I think it's better to have a personal relationship with God or whoever you feel that to be than to have a fundamental religion of God. To use an analogy, they're all naturally and gifted, different, but you don't have to tell a child to love or feel empathy and compassion. They just do. It's innate, just like their spiritual awareness at a young age before they learn differently. Ultimately, the foundation of every religion is love. Whatever we get to the esoterics teachings or not, we can see that. So what makes it okay for someone to go against the same love they humbled themselves to look down on somebody else because they chose to adhere to a different practice, even though it's for the same purpose. It's counterproductive. It's also a BS game of semantics. It's like, yo, I believe the same thing as you do. I believe if we do A, B, and C, then we'll reach set go, but I'll bait big out. I don't believe in the method verbatim. Heads start rolling and exploding. I'm being facetious, but seriously, to me, the title isn't everything. As long as the individual has a conviction to find peace within their spirit and life, then we have the capacity to be better as a collective and evade our collective consciousness. He had to have had somebody write this for him, but I don't know. He didn't been in jail that that long. I guess he didn't, he didn't read a couple of books. So yeah, I feel I've been grown into what I was always meant to progress from. I also try and stay true to what speaks to my spirit, whether it's my art or my poetry, or even what I decide to read. What you choose to internalize says a lot about you. Interestingly enough, I don't want you to get the impression that I've always stood firm on some. The universe works to our benefit. LOL, go figure, right? I had a very difficult upbringing. I've seen things a child should never have to bear, and I've been through struggles I wouldn't wish on anyone. There was plenty of times when I didn't think I'd breathe to see tomorrow. I, because cynical in hindsight, was only a shell of myself. I was detached. There was no forest, per- proverbially, no ground, no sky. Just me inside the elements of myself. There was no canvas that could add to my pain. Death frames itself. Everybody heals differently, but I had to question sooner or later, what are the scars from? Sometimes we're so caught up being self-consumed that you don't realize that pain was meant to be someone else's benefit. Maybe a lot of us were meant to be martyrs. Long point short, I stopped blaming God for the laws of the universe and found a better scope past what others choose to project on me. If you're blessed, I'll come to you. No one can take that. He speaks on the media and shares his final thoughts. Do I have any thoughts on the way the media in the country covers crime, prisons, and criminal criminal justice? Do I, as an inmate, get any sense of how the outside world sees these issues? Do you think it wouldn't be good for these issues to get more or different kinds of public attention. Yeah, no doubt. I don't agree with the dichotomy between the corporations and backroom lobbyists against the lower class. We all know money ultimately controls the media and media interests. Therefore, you have the you have entire sections and subgroups or the community being underserved when their voices aren't able to be heard. The images being shown and profiling being done doesn't properly advocate on behalf of the poor. It does just the opposite, as we know the media acts as a vision pole and creates opinions intended to promote a right-wing agenda because that's who controls the major media outlets. It seems that more progressive units doesn't don't really get the same exposure as far as networks go, i.e. the BBC independent news outlets like KPFT in Houston and the other Pacifica stations, NPR, NPR, etc. And that I'm sure we agree that corporate sponsorship means a lot. It's crazy enough though, because in a way I think the media plays a big part in undermining the public's interest, especially on crime. So a lot of the news being covered is what politicians play on in their campaigns, right? Let's say, for instance, gangs and violence. It's everywhere, right? Said politician pledges to rid the city of gangs and gun violence by a number of means, i.e. setting injunctions, 
creating laws for mandatory minimums, etc. He creates this through this throw on crime persona and if elected actually tries to get a lot of passed through legislation legislation and why not it's probably it probably won't receive any pushback because how many people do you know vote locally in addition it says the states receive government funding in the name of crime pre prevention instigated by the media right well the same media outlet never aired the fact that those gangs held gang summits to call attention to and stop neighborhood violence months before the elections took place. They failed to broadcast the protests held by Bloods and Crips and members of, of the Nation of Islam walking hand in hand to raise awareness and calling in to the young black men being gunned down by police officers nationwide. They failed to broadcast a lot of this weaponry being supplied by the government. Like, like in very recent events, the DEA and CIA flooding the streets with guns in an experiment to figure out how cartels were smuggling guns. Mexico's death rate went up to threefold almost overnight. No one quasi questions that. History tells us that some of the biggest criminals wear business suits. Bruh, put that on a shirt. Well, it is insane to think that the same corporations and our institutions that control the narrative of the media and influence the campaigns of government officials that subjectively help build onto the prison industrial complex, have stocks and interests in the same complex. There's always an agenda, and personally, I don't think it was a D thing to do with the little guy or immediacy of the public interest. Yeah, I think it'd be great if particular issues received different kinds of public attention, but like I've mentioned, it tends to be binary and sometimes very limited in scope. I think it should be all-encompassing. Not what the executive at Fox News deemed to be a news special. I take my situation, for example. It was never said that I had been evaluated by a psychiatrist and placed in an observation cell and put on suicide watch, or how I was, or how I was ordered not to be removed, or the fact written consent was never given to do an interview, which was their policy to be able and conduct the procedure, no one of which was mentioned. You only see the edited version of stupidity and ignorance that gave out let a story you know a lot of people are left to deal with the aftermath and backlash while trying to find unconventional ways of clearing their name i could say it'd be a definite benefit for the public to have various avenues but it's still up to the public to do research and find what they feel to be genuine so actually it creates the question of us needing multiple ways to stream coverage or the majority not having superficial views we have both of course but Maybe one tainted the other. Ultimately, and for the sake of question, I think it's imperative for us to have more independent content and movements on the grassroots level that publicize the dynamics of the struggle. Being able to advocate for a universal interest, human rights, etc., means more than some may think, but sometimes it doesn't mean being a spokesperson. It means creating a platform that protects that interest. When people don't feel they have a voice or interest in being served, they find another way. Simple power belongs to the people. What would I like to say to casual readers in my state and in the world at large about my life, my situation, and what I think it means about our country? If you're still reading this, from my hand to God's eyes, I hope these words have the capacity to find you with an open mind and heart of compassion. I don't want to make this a war is me story or drown the intent of this letter by detailing the struggles overcome to see my personality develop this far. I would think the only matter of importance is being able to have this opportunity and share this space and moment in time, a meeting of the minds. Since being sentenced to die, I've grown where they said I couldn't, cried when they claimed I had no emotions, protested with brothers and sisters because our humanity as a collective means something to me. I learned that I'm an artist, I'm a poet, I became an author and I strive in my struggle to be better than I was the day before. In time, I hope to be able to find the gateway to show life a different truth. I'd enjoy hearing from you and possibly the chance of building a friendship. In the meantime, be love and light. Peace. James Brodnex, 999549, Polinsky Unit, Death Row, 3872 FM, 350 South, Livingston, Texas, 77351, USA. Certainly not the first time I've sat across the plexiglass from admitted killers, but 
What I heard today was hard for me to both watch and listen to and will be hard for you. Two 19-year-old cousins, one remorseful, saying yes, they plan to rob someone but not to kill. The other saying he did it and saying it without feeling. You know what I'm saying? We did From right. jail, James Broadnax and Demarius Dwight Cummings talk about what happened last week when they killed Matthew Butler and Stephen Swan outside a Garland recording studio. Uh, the chopper was too big to rob somebody with, so we had one that got the pistol. The two trading an AK-47 for a handgun before taking the dart from South Dallas to Garland. I decided to go hit a lick, you know what I'm saying? And one of the best spots to go up, because that's where all the rich white folks stay, you know what I'm saying? Got caught, caught him up, she ain't popped his That's what it is. Without as much as a blink, James Broadnax talks about how he took two lives. And blank, you know what I'm saying? I shot him, like stumbled back, shot the uh, the driver. He hit the ground, you know what I'm saying? But he like leaned up, like he was finna try to get back up. So I shot him in the head. Then his homeboy, I shot his again, you know what I'm saying? But he was still trying to run out. But I knew he was going to die anyway, but just to make sure, pop, pop, shot his like, you know what I'm saying, twice in the head or whatever. Me and my Kim folks ran their pockets, you know what I'm saying. He jumped in the driver's seat, I jumped on past the side, and we dipped out. How much money did you guys get? No, he had $2 in his wallet, you know what I'm saying. Describing his life as, quote, hell, Broadneck says he has nothing to live for. I don't want life. You don't want life? Pick one. If they don't, I will. How do you feel today, Mr. Cummings? I feel real bad. You know, I feel that was wrong, what we did, you know. I know how their family felt to feel about it, you know what I'm saying? So how do you feel now? You know what I'm saying? I kind of regret what I did, but shit can't change. I know you was crying, though. What do you want them to know about you? I want them to know I didn't kill, I didn't kill nobody. I didn't kill her, uh, her husband or whatever, you know what I'm saying? But you do admit you contributed to it. Yeah, I contribute to it, but I didn't kill him, though. You sorry it happened, sir? Yes, yeah, so. What do you want to say to the families of the two men you killed? Straight up. Wow. Teresa Butler, the mother of Matthew Butler, says regardless of what those boys have to say, Matthew and Steve are in heaven. She goes on to say hopefully those two will get their justice. Now, you can see and hear Mrs. Butler's interview tonight on Fox 4 News at 9. And right now, the hard-to-watch chilling interview with the admitted killers is available for you on myfoxdfw.com.